Bibles together this morning and go to the book of Genesis, chapter number 23, please. The 23rd chapter in the book of Genesis is where we'll find our text this morning. And um, we're going to look at uh, a very difficult day in Abraham's life, uh, and yet such example that he sets for us. We've been walking through the life of Abraham together here on Sunday mornings. We're just going to tackle the first four verses of this particular chapter, Genesis chapter number 23. We'll begin reading in verse number one, and we'll read down through verse Number four, where the Bible says, And Sarah was in hundred and seven and twenty years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner. With you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Today, with the Lord's help, I'd like to preach to you a message that I've just simply entitled The Death of Sarah. The Death of Sarah. Several years ago, before I ever became the pastor here of this church, in many respects, you know, everyone that serves, you know, on the staff here is is sort of maybe a, a pastor in training, whether they ever uh, actually serve as a senior pastor or not, you're learning things constantly. And certainly I had uh, quite the education being, uh, had an, having an opportunity to serve here for 19 years before, or 18 and a half years I should say, before I ever became pastor. And I remember I was functioning as the youth pastor at this particular time when this took place and, and uh, serving also as an assistant pastor. And it always seemed like any time my dad, who, who was our pastor at the time, went out of town, Everything came undone. Everything went bad. It just seemed like uh, if there were bad things that were going to happen, and not necessarily people doing awful things, but just difficult things, grievous things, as far as maybe death or sickness, whatever the case might be, seemed like it happened when he was out of town. And so on this particular uh, weekend, I had planned a youth activity. I remember we were going to take our teams ice skating, and uh, I had just gotten to the ice skating rink, and and uh, the teens were all getting their skates on. And I, if I remember correctly, my oldest daughter was going to be skating with us that day. And so I remember I was down on my hands and knees, and I was, uh, I was, I was tightening up her skates uh, uh, for her to get out there. Hadn't even put mine on, and my cell phone began to ring. And I remember I picked it up, and I, I thought, well, I wonder who this is. And noticed from the caller ID, it was a member of our church. And I answered the phone, and they said, they said, listen, you know, we'd really like for you to, uh, to, to, to come over here pretty quickly. Brother so-and-so is very, very close to death. So I, uh, I, I realized that um, the folks that were there, the other youth workers and counselors and that sort of thing, they were more than capable of, uh, of uh, taking care of things. In fact, I was sort of glad to be getting out of ice skating, to be very frank with you, in that particular moment. And, uh, and I turned my skates in, and I uh, had someone drive me back to the church. I went home, and I changed or something a little nicer, and I went to the house to spend a few moments, would turn into several hours with this particular family, and I suppose that in some respects it might have been my, uh, my, my first glimpse of a, of a faithful family going through a particular event like this. When I walked into the home that afternoon, the man who would die within just a few short hours was laying in a hospital bed there in the, uh, in the living room, and he really wasn't... He really wasn't able to communicate uh, much at all. He was labored in his breathing, and the hospice team had come by, and they had sort of let the family know and prepared them, here's what's going to happen, and here's what, here's what things are going to look like. Many of you, many of you, probably almost all of you have walked that road, but it was my sort of first glimpse of experiencing this in a pastoral role, and so I really wasn't quite sure what my role was, what to say, what to do. I have to tell you that Bible college is great, but they don't always, they don't always prepare you for these moments. And I remember sitting there and, and uh, trying to figure out, okay, what, what should I say? When should I say it? What's my, what, what am I supposed to even be doing here, to be honest with you? And I was sort of watching this family. Maybe they were watching me. And I have to tell you, I was astounded by what I saw. There in that room, there's, there's no mistaking it, there were tears and there was sorrow. But I have to tell you, the number of hours that I spent there that day, did you know that we sat there and we laughed? I mean, we laughed a lot. We, we, we laughed uh, and when we re- remembered and reminisced about this 
individual and the life that they had lived and some of the things that they had done. And, uh, and while there was sorrow and there was grief and there were tears, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, there was a sense of joy in that room. There was a sense of rejoicing in that room. And I remember, I remember leaving there and thinking to myself, well, I have just witnessed the grace of God poured out upon a family during what is perhaps the most difficult moment of their lives. I went home that night. I was preaching the next day. I went home that night because the family told me, you have to go home. He was hanging on. He hadn't passed yet. And they said, we want you to get some rest before you, uh, uh, before you preach tomorrow. And so I remember I went home, and the individual didn't live far from where my home was. I remember I got up the next morning, and I was just walking out of the house to go to men's prayer meeting early that morning when my phone rang again. And it was this family letting me know that this gentleman had just slipped out into eternity, into the arms of Jesus, into his forever eternal home. And of course, I left my duties here and ran to the house and spent just a little bit more time with them. And that was maybe my first glimpse or uh, first look at maybe helping a family through the process of death and, and, and grieving. And I just have to tell you, I'll never, I'll never forget that night. And since then, God has allowed me uh, to uh, witness many other families grieve, but yet do so with hope and with joy. I want this, I want this to be the reality when it's my time to depart from this earth. I really do. I want, I want my family to sit around and I want them to reminisce and, to, and, and even laugh just a little bit. Maybe some of the crazy things that I did or some of the, maybe the messes that I got us into as a family. Uh, uh, and, and I want us to, I, I, want, I, want them to, I want them to let me go knowing, knowing when it's my time to go, that they know where I'm going and they know they're going to see me again someday. You know, the Bible, the Bible has much to say about the subject of death. Perhaps, perhaps you said, I didn't come to church this morning to think about death, but I think it's good for us in the house of God to contemplate our own mortality. Did you know that the God's Word teaches us how death became part of our lives? In other words, we, we, we read God's Word and we discover, oh, that's why, that's why death is a reality for us. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse number 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Why? For that all have sin. God's Word also teaches us the difference between physical death and spiritual death. There are, according to the Bible, there are two deaths. There's a physical death, and there is a, uh, there is a spiritual death. And spiritual death is separation from God for all eternity in a place called the lake of fire, just as physical death is separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. The Bible tells us in Revelation 21 and verse number 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God's word also teaches us what comes after death. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You know, I really feel sorry for people that believe that once they die, that just ends everything. There's a lot of people living in our world that just think you live your life 60, 70, 80 years here on this earth, and then you draw your last breath, and then you cease to exist, boy, they're going to be in for quite an awakening, aren't they? When they realize on the other side, according to Scripture, that once we die, we carry on. We stand before God in judgment that there is, uh, there is a reality of life after this life here on this earth. God's Word teaches, did you know that God's Word teaches us how to live and never die? I think that's probably one of the greatest things that Jesus ever said during his earthly ministry. He said it at a cemetery near the place where they had buried Lazarus, with Lazarus' sisters grieving and brokenhearted over the passing of their brother. Listen to what Jesus said in John eleven twenty five 25 and 26. Jesus said in her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? One of these days, one of these days, you're going to get word that Pastor Pete has died. And I just want to go on record this morning, on Sunday, June the 11th, 2023, I want, you to, I, want you, I want to say this, don't you dare believe it. 
Don't you dare believe it. Why? Because Jesus said that whosoever believeth in me shall never die. I'm going to be living. I'm going to be living somewhere. I'm going to be living better there than I ever lived here. Don't you believe it. If you know someone who knows Christ as their Savior and their salvation is settled and they have confidence that they're in Christ, don't you, don't you believe it when you hear someone say they've died? No, they haven't. No, they haven't. Oh, they've, they've ceased to live down here, but they're living somewhere. Because Jesus said, Jesus said, you can live and never die. God's word teaches us that. To view death strictly as dark, eerie, and something to be despised is not an attitude that aligns with Scripture or the life of faith. Did you know that God's word not only teaches us all of these things that we have mentioned previously, but did you know that God's word also teaches us that death can be beautiful and precious? Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 116 and verse number 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Are you a believer today? Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal savior today? Then did you know that, that, that when it comes your time to go, while we sometimes look at that as the worst day of life, our family looks at that as the worst day of life, understand that from a biblical perspective, God looks at that and he says, that's precious. It's beautiful. It's beautiful perhaps as maybe some of you having a family member that's coming to visit you. And you work diligently to prepare the house for their arrival and you wait, and you, you uh, nowadays, you know, we can track it where everybody is with our phones, and perhaps maybe they've shared their locations with you, and you're watching it. They're coming up the road. They're not too far. They're only an hour or two away. And all of a sudden, those, those lights pull into that driveway, and those doors open, and you go running out of the house to throw your arms around that person. You understand, we understand that that's the reality for us physically, but understand this, listen, when a believer dies, when a saint dies, that's the reality for them spiritually that God is watching from the other side I, I you know you hear these jokes that are being told you know one of the guy went to heaven and St. Peter greeted him there at the gates I don't know about you but I don't want St. Peter to greet me at the gates I want Jesus to greet me at the gates and I believe I believe he will why because precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints I'm not I'm not in a hurry to die I'm not I'm not eager to get there I've got much to live for down here i got a lot of things that I want to do, and i got a lot of things that I want to accomplish, but I'm just telling you, when I read the scriptures, it readjusts my focus as it relates to death. And while most of the world is clinging on to life with everything they have within them, as a believer, as a believer in Christ, listen, there is no fear in death. There is no fear in death whatsoever. Those who have a proper perspective informed by God's word in reality, they're able to take a much more positive and confident approach to death. Listen to what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, I say, and willing, willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Apostle Paul also said this in Philippians 1, 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do we really believe the Bible? I mean, we say we believe it, but do we really believe it? Because a lot of times, I don't know that we live, we live quite like we believe that. The Apostle Paul said for him to live was Christ and to die for him was gain. It was a good thing. Verse number 23, he said this of that same passage. He says, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. One of these days, you and I are going to draw our last breath here on this earth and we're going to depart to be with Christ. You know what Paul said about that? He said that's far better than any life down here on this earth. I think most of us have lived long enough to understand the reality of that. The 23rd chapter of Genesis is an example of a family dealing with death by faith. We find, did you know that we find more space dedicated to the death of Sarah than just about any other Bible character? If you study your Bible, you'll find, you'll find that oftentimes, even about someone like King David, and he died, and he was buried with his fathers. I mean, there really isn't a whole lot that would, is often said about the death of an individual. But the truth of the matter is, in Genesis chapter 23, we have a whole chapter dedicated to the death of Sarah. Some of the actions that <clears throat> Abraham displayed following her death. What is it about her death and how Abraham conducted himself in this season that we should have so much space dedicated to it? I believe there's some real lessons 
that God would have for us as we consider the death of Sarah. Number one, allow me to share this first thought with you. That is this, that we have an appointment with death. We have an appointment with death. The Bible says in verse number one that Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died in Kerjeth Arba. Sarah's appointment with death occurred when she was 127 years old. Now that's up there, isn't it? That's a long life down here. Most of us, probably the vast, probably all of us in this room won't live to be as old as Sarah lived in this particular text. At the time of her death, her husband was 137 and her son was 37 years old, meaning, meaning that God had blessed Sarah with the privilege of watching her son grow to be a man. I think in, in many respects, that's, that's, that's often really most of what any of us want to do. I just want to live long enough to see my, my, my children grow up and to see them perhaps you know, go out on their own and begin to develop. And sometimes that, that doesn't always happen. There are cases that all of us can think of in which someone perhaps didn't quite make it that far. But God allowed Sarah that privilege and that opportunity to watch her son Isaac grow to be a man. When Sarah and Abraham moved from Haran to Canaan, she was 65 years old. Uh, that afforded her, listen, think about that, that afforded her 62 years of following her husband in this life of faith. You know, there are many metrics and designations, um, you know, that we can enjoy in life, but ultimately, listen, ultimately we must all acknowledge this truth, and that is this, that you and I have an appointment with death. Every one of us have an appointment with death. We can put that out of our minds. We can try not to think about it. Uh, we, we, can, uh, we can ignore it as long as possible. We like to live a life in which we enjoy control over all of our circumstances. But can I remind you that with death, with death, we enjoy very little control over those circumstances. Now, what I'm going to share with you is in a natural sense. And the next two thoughts, as we consider our appointment with death, comes naturally. As I, as I say this, all of us are going to think of folks who maybe, maybe took matters into their own hands as it relates to their own mortality. But I'm saying just living naturally, number one, there are some things that you and I cannot control in death. There are some things that living naturally that you and I cannot control in death. I want to share three of them with you. Some of them are seen right here in our text. Number one, number one is this, when we die. When we die is something that you and I have no control over as it relates to a natural sense. Some die young, while others die when they are quite old. Sarah here dies at the age of 127, while her husband, who already was 10 years her senior, will enjoy 38 more years of life before dying at the age of 175, according to Genesis 25 and verse number 7. I'll be 44 in just a few short days. And I assume, I assume I have upwards of four more decades to live. I was sharing this with the men on Wednesday night in my class. I was preparing for this message on Wednesday. And I, um, I, I typically write things out by hand. And so I was writing things out, and I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to go a little bit longer than that. I wanted to say, you know, I, I mean, I, surely, I, surely I must have 50, 60 years left. And then it dawned on me, no, you probably don't. And that was a little sobering for me. I remember, hearing my, I remember hearing my dad at one point say something like this. He would say, I've got, I've got more behind me than I have in front of me. And I thought, well, that stinks for him, but that's not my reality. But look, look, at, look how, quickly, how, how quickly we get to a point where it is, it is likely that, uh, that if the Lord doesn't return, I have, I, have, I have less in front of me than I have behind me. That happened fast. Some of you, some of you, that is your reality. It's been your reality for quite a while, and you acknowledge that. You know, I really don't know when I will die. I don't know how long I will live. Really, that's out of my hands. I, I, think, I think that I'm fairly healthy, but you know as well as I do, you know as well as I do that, that this week I could discover something, you could discover something that is troubling your body that you had no idea was even happening and, 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 and this week, this week, you and I could come to church next Sunday and realize, listen, I have a whole lot shorter down here than I thought I had. Life is so very fragile, isn't it? There's some things about life and about death that we have no control over. One of those things is this idea of when we die. But notice, secondly, we, we also have in, 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 in death things that we don't have any control over. We don't have any control over where we die. 
The Bible says that Sarah was 127 years old when she died. And the Bible says that she died in Kirjith Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. You know, many, many people wish to die at home, surrounded by what is familiar to them. It brings great comfort to think of departing this life, holding the hands of our closest loved ones in a place where we're most accustomed. But you know, we really have no control over this either. Our wishes may be fulfilled. You might get that opportunity. You might get the opportunity to, to determine, okay, I'm in the hospital, I'm, I'm dying, I'm actively dying, I want you to transfer me home, I want to be in my home, in my living room, surrounded by my family. You might get that opportunity, but you might not. Some people die of heart attacks suddenly. Some people die in car accidents. Some people die uh, in, other, in other ways, in hospitals, in nursing homes, in hospice facilities. Some people die at the office. So, the truth of the matter is we have no control over the when of our death. We also have little control over the where of our death as well. Again, we assume, we assume, you know, well, if I have my, if I have my uh, wishes fulfilled, I'm going to die at a good old age, and I'm going to die at home with my wife, holding my wife's hand, and with my children surrounding me. But none of us have control over those things. Those are wants and wishes, but there's no guarantees as it relates to those things. There's a third element in which we have no control. Again, again we're talking about naturally here, and that is not only that we have no control over when we die, where we die, but also how we die. The Bible doesn't really tell us how or why Sarah died. We, we can assume that maybe, maybe it was old age, but we don't know that for sure. She, she, she might die of cancer. Maybe she died of Alzheimer's. Maybe she died of a sudden heart attack or a stroke. We really don't know. Have you ever thought, what is it that's going to get you? I wouldn't encourage you to think about that too long or too often. So I suppose every once in a while we think about that sort of thing. What is it that's ultimately going to claim me, that's going to cause me to cease to live life down here on this earth? Likely none of us know what that is. I'm just simply trying to paint a picture for you this morning that many of the circumstances surrounding our death is out of our hands. But I want, I want to leave you with this thought, and that is this, you you should know that the most important matter surrounding your death is completely under your control. When people think about how they're going to die, and they think about when they're going to die and where they're going to die, that, that oftentimes maybe fills their mind, and that's, that's what they focus on. And there are people even today, some of you maybe who have done this, you've, you've pre-planned your funeral. You've bought the plots, and you've said, this is the funeral home I, wanna, I, I, wanna, I want my family to work with, and, and, and this is the suit of clothes I want to be buried. I mean, you, you, you may have gone all the way down that road, and, and, and those things may seem like they're important and they're significant, but I can, assure, I can assure you of this, they're insignificant when you go. But you have control. You have control over the most important element of your death. And I want us to consider, secondly, what we can control in death. There is something that you have complete and total control of when you die. While I may not be able to control the when, the where, and the how of my death, God has allowed me, God has allowed me to make the most important decision of all as it relates to my death, and that is this, where I will go when I die. And that decision is in your hands as well. Completely and totally. There are only two options or choices available according to Scripture. One will either spend eternity in a place the Bible calls hell. At some point, hell and death are going to be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Or, or you can spend eternity in a place called heaven, also known as the Father's house according to John chapter number 14. To spend eternity in hell, you must do absolutely nothing. You're already heading there. Every one of us who are born, we're born sinners. And the Bible has already told us that because of our sin, uh, we must die. And, and, and our death will eventually lead us, because of our sin and our sin nature, will lead us to a place the Bible calls hell. So you were born heading there. You were born on the fast track to hell. You get 60, 70, 80 years if you're fortunate down here on this earth. But every individual has ever been born because of sin and their sin nature is heading to a place called hell. Those who are born physically and never experience any change in that status will automatically discover a place in hell reserved for them for all of eternity. Now, most thinking people don't want to spend eternity in a place like that. 
Oh, we've heard, we've heard a few people say things like, well, that's where my buddies are going to be, and that's where I'm going to go, and different things like that. But if you get someone to really think it through for just a moment, if you get them really to believe in the reality of hell as it's taught to us in the Bible, no thinking person wants to go there. To spend a second there, much less to spend eternity there. There can't be anybody in this room. There can't be anybody in this room that is a thinking person who perhaps has never experienced a new birth who would say, yeah, I want to go there. I want to spend eternity in a place where it's complete and total darkness, where there's screams of agony where the fire never goes out, where the burning is, is eternal and yet, and yet no one is ever extinguished totally and completely. Yeah, I want to go to a place like that. No, nobody, nobody wants to go to a place like that. Everyone, everyone wants to go to a place like heaven. But can I remind you that, that just as you, you, don't, you can't do anything, you can't do anything, uh, you, you go to hell, you just, just live as you are. But can I also remind you, you can't do anything to go to heaven either. That's a problem, isn't it? You see, all of us are sinners, and heaven is a perfect place. It's a place where sin and sinners and wickedness is not allowed. It's a, it's a place with, uh, with gates around it that would forbid anyone from like, that, like that from ever going there. And, and, and your, your good works are not sufficient to get you to a place like, like heaven. So we're helpless in some respects. We're born into this life, physically heading to hell, and, and there's not a thing in the world that we can do about it. Puts us in a tough spot, doesn't it? Oh, but the Bible, the Bible says that God sent his son, the sinless son of God who died on a cross, his name was Jesus, who was buried and who rose again the third day. And by believing in him, by believing in him, not in doing anything, but just some, simply by looking to him in faith, by believing in him, one can enjoy uh, salvation, new birth and life, as well as an eternal home in heaven. John chapter 3 and verse number 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, the Bible says, For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile or deceit found in his mouth. Verse number 24 says this, Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. You understand, when Jesus hung on that cross, Everything that he did, everything that he suffered was in your place and was in my place. The stripes that he bore were my stripes. The nail that was pierced into his hands, into his feet, that nail was reserved for me. That crown that he wore, that crown of thorns that they pressed into his brow so that the blood began to drip off of his, off of his forehead and down his cheeks and, and onto the ground, all of it, listen, all of that was for me. That tomb that he was buried in, that was my tomb. That, 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 that time that he spent, whatever it was that he was doing in those three days and those three nights, that, that was being done on my behalf. And if I'll just look to the sinless Son of God, if I'll just believe on the name of Jesus Christ, I can be saved. And so can you. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that as, a, as an 11-year-old boy, I'm thankful that I came to the end of myself and I understood I couldn't save myself. And I looked to Jesus and he saved me. And I know that he saved me. He lives within my heart. He's made a change. Oh, there's more change still to be made in my life. But I know this. I know that heaven is my home. I can't control when I'm going to die. I can't control where I'm going to die. I can't control how I'm going to die. But I can control where it is I'll spend eternity. And so can you. You're here today and you're not certain that heaven is your home. You're not certain that you have eternal life. You might ask, well, what must I do? And the answer is you can't do anything. Jesus has already done it. You just have to look to him. You have to believe on his name. And receive his son, his gift of eternal life. In just a few moments, we'll stand together. We'll sing a hymn of invitation. and We'll invite. That's what an invitation is. We invite folks to, to come and to Make decisions based upon what they've heard here today. And if you're lost and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, may today be the day in which you look to him. I want you to notice there's a second, 
thing that we discover in our text, not only that there's an appointment that we have with death, but notice that there is sorrow in death, according to verses two and three. The Bible says in verse number two, and Sarah died. The end of the verse, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. You know, I, I think to myself as I consider this idea of there being sorrow and death, just looking at the life of Abraham, we notice that natural sorrow is normal and healthy. Natural sorrow is normal and healthy. You know, we don't know how long Abraham and Sarah were married, but we can guess that it might have been close to, if not more, than 100 years. Because they had the same father, Sarah had known Abraham as long as she could remember. And he had known her since he was 10 years old. Now think about that. Over a hundred years that they had known one another, that they had lived with one another and, and, uh, and, and spent time with one another. It is not reasonable to be in this type of relationship for that length of time and not to mourn when that is taken away. It's important to note that Abraham's sorrow does not seem to evidence regret. I think that's an important thought. Often at death, people grieve the loss of the presence of their loved one but they also grieved the loss of the opportunity to show that loved one how much they cared for them. Can I, can I just encourage you today? Sometimes we, we, take it, we take advantage or we take for granted the presence of an individual in our life. Sometimes we don't express our love to them like we ought to. Sometimes we don't hug them as much as we should. Perhaps sometimes we don't always share with them the things that are on our heart. We hold those things back. Can I encourage you? Can I encourage you to go to the person that you love? Maybe it's been a while and to express your love to them. Perhaps maybe there's, maybe there's some friction between you and someone that you love. Can I encourage you to go to that person and make that right with them? Hey, listen, several months ago I said this, I did this. I feel like there's something between us, and I just want you to know I love you. And I don't want that to be between us anymore. I value your friendship. I value the relationship that we enjoy together. None of us know how much time we have down here on this earth. And I want to make sure that I am in as right of a relationship with others as I possibly can be. I don't, I don't sense that there's any regret in Abraham's sorrow. Many lose loved ones in which there are significant things that need to be cleared up between them. But now it is too late. This does not seem to be the basis of Abraham's sorrow, but it would, again, be wise to remind ourselves to live in such a way that there are no regrets when it comes time to say goodbye. Joseph Parker said that to avoid the sorrow of regret, this is good advice, listen to what he said. He said, make your homes happy. Banish from the sacred enclosure of the family all meanness, hardness, suspicion, and unkindness, that when the dark day comes, as come it will too soon, your deep and tender sorrow may not be missed with bitterness of self-reproach. Well, that's so true. Perhaps you live in a neighborhood in which you, you can hear your neighbors barking at each other and throwing things around. We've, we've all been there. Sometimes we've been that neighbor. <laughs> Don't be like that. Make your home a happy place. Make your home a place where the family members who live there want to come home. They look forward to it. Sometimes people, sometimes people work and work and pick up extra jobs and they do more and more. They'll tell you it's about money, but in reality, it's not about money. They've got plenty of money. The reality is the home is not a happy place. They don't want to be anywhere near there. There's bitterness and hostility. There's hard words. There's meanness and anger. It's ugly. It's an ugly place to be. That ought not to be the state of our homes, not as believers. Life is way too short to tolerate that sort of thing. There, but natural sorrow is normal and healthy. We understand that. But may there, may there not be, when our, when our time comes to go or when our loved one's time is to go, may there not be regret over words that we wish we would have spoken or things that we wish we would have done. Notice we see not only that natural sorrow is normal and healthy, but we discover something in verse number three, and that is this. We sorrow, but not as others who have no hope. Would you look in verse number three? And Abraham, so he's weeping, he's mourning in verse number two. And then notice verse number three. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter four and verse number 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That term asleep just means those who have died with their faith in Christ. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no 
you know, natural sorrow is normal and, and it's healthy. But I want you to know that there's a reality for Christians that gives evidence of a hope-filled sorrow. This sorrow does not replace our tears. It doesn't just automatically cause them to vanish so that as, as, as believers we, we, we come to death and we just sort of act like robots. Did you know that the prophet Ezekiel, did you know that God came to him and God said, I'm going to remove the love of your life from your life. And God said this, God said, I want you to get up tomorrow and I want you to carry on without crying, without any sorrow. That was God's God's message to Ezekiel. You know why God had to tell Ezekiel that? Because Ezekiel naturally would have been a mess. Now God was trying to illustrate something. God was trying to teach his people a lesson. The prophets had to live incredibly difficult lives in order to obey God and to follow his will for their lives. But naturally, Ezekiel would have been crying. And even though he was a prophet of God, even though he was a faithful man, so the hope-filled sorrow that we're talking about, it doesn't remove our grief. It doesn't just automatically bind up our broken hearts so that we can carry on the next day as if nothing happened. I, I, I don't want you to, to think that at all. I share with you that opening thought there when I was with that family. And in the midst of our joy, in the midst of our laughter and reminiscing, there were tears. There was sorrow that's very real in the life of a believer. But it's, it's mixed with hope. This sorrow doesn't replace our tears, but it does allow us to smile in the midst of our suffering. Well, Abraham is filled with natural grief. Look what he does. He stands up and he moves forward with what? With his responsibilities in life. We're going to see Abraham bury his wife, and then we're going to see him go on living in the succeeding chapters. Is this because he doesn't care that Sarah has passed and that he'll see her again no more down here on this earth? No, not at all. Here's here's why he's able to do that. Because he knows where Sarah is and he knows he's going to see her again. You know what that's called? That's called hope. That's called grieving and sorrowing with hope that allows us to walk to the cemetery and to say goodbye, but just a temporary goodbye. I'll see you again on the other side. I'll see you tomorrow morning when the Lord Jesus Christ returns or when he calls me home. Can I pause here for a moment and say that prolonged sorrow can be potentially, can potentially be dangerous as it could lead to depression and despair in our life. Despite people's concern and care, some, some will even begin to distance themselves from an individual who carries their sorrow constantly with them. Now, I'm not here to to beat anybody up who's in a period of mourning and grieving. You take the time that you need. But I think it's pretty clear in this scripture that one of the greatest things that can help us, one of the greatest things that can help us when dealing with something like this is to keep on living life. At some point, to get up from our position of mourning and weeping, and to carry on with our responsibilities. For Abraham, that was securing a burial plot. In chapter number 24, we're going to find that Abraham commissions his servant to go find his son a wife. We're going to find that Abraham eventually even marries again. We're going to see all of that in in Abraham's life. We're going to see that the thing that can help us the most is to keep on living. It's not only unhealthy for our bodies and our relationships to be in a prolonged period of just mourning and weeping and just keeping our sorrow and carrying our sorrow with us at all times. But can I tell you, in some respects, it also betrays our faith in God. It really does. Because when I walk around in a constant state of mourning, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying this, I've lost this person and I don't know if I'm ever going to get to see them again. And the reality is I am going to get to see them again. Oh, my heart can be broken, there can be despair, there can be difficulty there. But listen, at a certain point, at a certain point, I have to pick myself back up and I have to carry on with life, knowing, knowing that I do not sorrow as others who have no hope. And Abraham's example teaches us that. Hope-filled sorrow is the key. Keep on living, fulfill your responsibilities, and rediscover purpose in your life like Abraham did. Thirdly and finally, we discover the faith displayed in death. There's two thoughts that I want to point out to you from verse number four. There are two statements that Abraham makes that I believe are incredible statements of faith. I I think that those that were listening to him that day, they just took them as, as face value. And maybe even, maybe even as Abraham said these things, maybe he wasn't even thinking about the long range 
implications of what he was saying. But I want you to know something. God took note of what Abraham said this day. There's two statements I want you to consider that are statements of great faith. And did you know that when you and I come to the, to the valley of the shadow of the crossing of death, when we, when we come to that point, when our loved ones come to that point, and our coworkers and our lost family members and our neighbors are watching us, did you know that in that moment we have an incredible opportunity to display our faith in God? That's exactly what Abraham did here. Notice the two statements that he makes. I want to sort of paraphrase them. In verse number four, he said, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Here's the, here's the first statement that, that is a statement of faith displayed in death, and that is this. This world is not my home. That's what he's saying. You say, how do, how do you know? Isn't that, a, isn't that a statement that basically just says that I'm in Canaan and Canaan isn't mine at this point in time? Well, that might have been how Abraham meant it. I, I think actually he probably meant it in a, in a more faith-filled way. That's certainly how the sons of Heth would have understood him to say it. But I want you to hold your place, if you would, in your Bible, and I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, God was taking note of what, day, of what Abraham said on that particular day. God wrote that down for us. A little bit later on in Scripture, would you look with me in verse number 11? I'm sorry, in verse number 13 of Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> the Bible says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed. Confessed, notice there it is, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's exactly what Abraham said. All the words sojourner in Genesis 23, that's the same thing as pilgrim. I'm just wandering through. I don't really belong here. Let's keep reading. Look in verse number 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Well, what country are you seeking, Abraham? Well, it wasn't the country that you might think. No, it wasn't a physical plot of ground or land keep reading verse 15 and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had opportunity to return but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly isn't that encouraging you know what abraham is saying here he, he's saying listen i i know I'm, I'm my heart is broken but i want you to know something this world has never been my home this, this life down here is temporary, it's fleeting. I'll be here for just a little while. Our faith allows us to live this life and face death with confidence and certainty that a better country is waiting for us on the other side. What have we witnessed in our world over the last few years? We've witnessed people clinging, clinging to this life with all of their might. Don't leave your home. Don't step outside of the walls of your house. It's dangerous out there. You want to keep on living? Then you've got to insulate yourself. You've got to protect yourself. Listen, I'm all for good sense and making common sense choices and decisions. But I'm also, listen, I'm also all for living life. Living life in a way that obviously pleases and honors the Lord. You know, I, I'm, not here to, I'm not here to tempt you know, death. I'm, I'm, not looking to, I'm not looking to go. I'm not looking to put myself in a crazy place. Not too long ago, I was, in a, I was in a place where I had an opportunity to ride a four-wheeler with my son. And the guy that was going to allow me to ride it, he said, now this thing, this thing can get pretty crazy in a hurry. And uh, he said, it's got a lot of power. I think it was something like a 750. I don't know a 750 from a 250, but that's what he told me. I don't know what that means, size of the engine. I don't know. I'm the last guy to ask when it comes to that sort of thing. You know, I looked at him. I said, sir, I said, you, you understand, I am not a daredevil. I am, I'm probably going to putz along. You're probably going to think that I belong in a, in a rest home somewhere, you know, the way I'm going to drive this thing. I'm just not. That's just not me. So I'm not looking. I'm not looking to die. I'm not looking to do anything crazy. But the, rea the reality is, listen, there are people in our world that are holding on to, to life with everything they have desperate to live another few days, to live another year or two. Oh, think about, think about how we've lived these last few years, most clinging to this life. But I want you to know something. Listen, as believers, God gives us peace and comfort knowing that what is waiting for us on the other side is joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
As believers, we run into trouble when we lose sight of this. And when we start to live like that world and we start to hold on to this life with everything that we have in our ability, though the sons of Heth would have understood Abraham's declaration in a physical sense that he was a stranger and a sojourner among them, it is clear that God heard those same words and God understood them in a spiritual sense. There's a statement of faith. And that statement is this, this world is not my home, but there's a second great statement of faith that Abraham makes. Not only is that statement, this world is not my home, but he says a second thing. And that is this, he says, I believe God. You say, now where does, it, where does he say I believe God? Well, look at it. I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Notice, give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. You say, that doesn't sound like a statement that says, I believe God. But hold on for just a minute. Abraham said, I want a possession of a burying place with you. Now, why is that significant? Though he was a stranger and a sojourner, God had made a promise to him. And that promise was this. One of these days, I'm going to give this land that you're a stranger and a sojourner in, I'm going to give it to your seed for." ever that's the promise that had been made in fact god reiterated that promise in the previous chapter would you look in genesis 22 we look in verse number 17 that in blessing i will bless thee and in multiplying i will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore notice and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies abraham's longing to bury sarah here and himself to someday be buried in this same place is an acknowledgement It's an acknowledgement of the promise that God had made to Abraham and had repeated over and over again to someday, to someday give his seed this land and his faith. Did you know that Abraham's great-grandson displayed a similar faith? A man by the name of Joseph at the very end of Genesis, I want you to see it with me. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 50. We'll finish here this morning. In Genesis chapter 50, Joseph is departing. He's an old man as well. He's lived a good long life. He's Abraham's great-grandson. Perhaps maybe he'd heard the story of Abraham and what he had done. And Abraham had made an impact on Joseph's life, though he likely never would have met him. But notice Joseph displays a similar faith. Look in verse 24 of Genesis 50. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land, the land of Egypt, unto the land, the land of Canaan, where Abraham buried Sarah and where Abraham would be buried, the land that God had promised to give him. Joseph believed that he said, God will bring you out of this land, into the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. You know what Joseph's saying? Joseph's saying, listen, you're going to put me in a box, but make sure you don't leave that box in Egypt. One of these days, still several hundred years in the future, but Joseph was looking forward by faith, and he understood that God was going to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a land that they would be slaves in, that they would be uh, captives in, and that they would, uh, they would be miserable in. God was going to bring them up out of that land, and God was going to give them the land of Canaan. And Joseph said, by faith, don't you dare leave my bones in this place. You carry my bones with you. And you'll discover that on the night, on the night in which they were released, let my people go. And finally, he said, leave. You'll discover that as they were packing up their things, they were careful. They were careful to bring the bones of Joseph with them. It's all about faith. Abraham said, I want to bury my wife here. Even though we're strangers and we're sojourners, even though this world is not our home, even though this isn't really our land, I wanted to be buried here because someday it's going to be our land. I want to be buried in a place You want to be buried in a place, most of us want to be buried in a place near our other loved ones and where our family lives. Most people do that. Every once in a while, not as much happens anymore, but used to be that someone would die having lived a lot of their life up here. They want to be buried back home. And so we do a service for them here, and then the funeral home would take their body back to a place like West Virginia or Pennsylvania or Kentucky or Tennessee or wherever it was that they came to us from. What were they doing? They were going back to their roots in some respects. They were going back home. Abraham said, I want to be buried at home. I want my wife to be buried at home. Wait a minute, Abraham, this isn't your home. No, it's not right now, but God said someday it's going to be. 
What faith? What faith? 